this video we're going to be talking about microbiological aspects of staphylococcus or as a gram-positive microorganism. Now, what are the microbiological features? So on screen you can see what a staphylococcus aureus would look like under a microscope. So you can see that they're gram-positive because they're, you know, usually when we think about gram-positive we think about a purple colour, hence why I've labelled it purple. So from this video always think staphylococcus aureus is gram positive because of the purple background they usually are occur in spherical shape or a great black clusters and they're non-motile now where are the normal few facts so normal reservoir include such as nasal mucosa and 25 percent of the population are carriers as well as they can be found on the skin so it's normal to find staphylococcus aureus in the normal flora as well as such as normal flora including nasal mucosa as well as skin now the transmission usually includes from hands, sneezing and surgical wounds, contaminated food such as uh, leftover potatoes as well as canned food especially, hence um, because they love to grow on these type of things. So each time you open a canned food, try to finish it or at least seal it and put it in the fridge because otherwise Staphylococcus would can potentially grow on your food. Now what are the morphological features? Because this is the most important slide in this whole video. The genus features include their gram-positive cocci spherical in shape. They usually occur in clusters, remember great black clusters. They're non-motile, so when you look under the microscope, they do not move. They're non-spore forming, and rarely they can form capsules. So that's four points. Now the culturative features include their facultative anaerobes, so i.e. they only grow in anaerobic conditions. They're usually non-fastidious, meaning they're not fussy, basically, that's how I think of it. They can grow from a various de uh, different ranges of temperature. They're usually halophiles, you don't need to know this, means that even in under sodium chloride conditions or um, alkaline conditions, they can still grow. They're usually large, round, and the main takeaway point from this slide is the they form golden yellow colonies, often with hemolysis on blood agar when grown on blood agar. So when you do a gram staining, usually they come out gram positive. Um, then they uh, when you look under a microscope, they're cocci and spherical in shape, usually non-motile, non-spore forming, but rarely can form capsules. They're usually facultative anaerobes, so if you try to grow it in aerobic conditions, it wouldn't happen. That would, the result would come back negative. They're usually non-fastidious. And on blood agar, which is a type of test that you use in the micro microbiological labs, they usually grow with golden yellow colonies, often with hemolysis. Now a further test that you can do is a biochemical test, which is you can either add mannitol and the and staph aureus usually ferments mannitol in anaerobic conditions, hence why they're catalase positive and they're also coagulase positive. So the main take home points away from there, they're catalase positive, they're coagulase positive, they're gram positive, so you remember that from the purple background. So grape like cluster from the picture here and they're non motile they're non-spore forming but rarely can form capsules, non halophile anaerobic conditions is the best way they grow and they form large round yellow colonies on blood agar. Now what are the virulence factors of what does staph aureus, what are the, what are the uh, mechanisms by which they cause infections and diseases? Now there are two main ones, so they cause it by toxins and they also cause by enzymes. So let's now look at the toxins. So the first toxin that you usually would have learned about is hemolysin. They use, hemolysin is a toxin that usually causes beta hemolysis. They also use toxic shock syndrome, TSS, usually associated with tampon use. And they can also have enterotoxins. So far we have three, hemolysin, toxic shock syndrome, TSS, as well as enterotoxins associated with vomiting and diarrhea. So if someone has been infected with staph aureus and they present with vomiting, diarrhea, gastroenteritis or some sort of epigastric pain, think enterotoxins is a type of toxin or virulence factor that's being used by the staph aureus. They also have exfoliative toxins which is causing scaled skin syndrome which I will go into uh, which I'll show in the later on in the PowerPoint. So the one I want you, to, want you to remember from this video is the virulence factors include toxins and enzymes and in the toxins you have enterotoxins, exfoliative toxins which means exfoliating like the skin. They cause basically dry skin and um, folded skin to kind of peel off from your surface of your face, various different parts, elbows, uh, upper arm and stuff, toxic shock syndrome and hemolysin. Now the enzymes that they use are coagulase which clots, uh, the enzyme coagulase usually is involved in the Hemo, uh, cascade of the blood clotting factors and they usually clot plasma and coats the bacterial cell to probably prevent phagocytosis. 
they can also work by DNA deoxyribonuclease so they break down the cellular DNA within the body of our humans they can also cause stuff they also have staphylokinase which is another enzyme so you can know these are all enzymes by the ending of the words ACE coagulase DNA staphylokinase staphylokinase dissolves fibrin and aids in spread and they also have three others which are not so important but you can know this for your extra uh, points are beta lactamase drug resistance so given an antibacterial they're usually very resistant such as uh, amoxicillin um, was it, you know staph MRSA are basically methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus that's what MRSA stands for so they're beta lactamase resistant drug resistance they can also be protein they also produce protein A which binds the FC region of immunoglobulin G you need to research about that because in this video I'm trying to make it as short as I can and they also release something called staphylosanthin which is a bacterial antioxidant which helps the microbe evade reactive oxygen species so reactive oxygen species are common things found within our bodies trying to destroy our usual DNA and stuff so they can somehow evade this so, so prevent their own destructions so two main take home points were they can work via toxins and enzymes enzymes include coagulase DNAs, staphylokinase, as well as beta lactamase, protein A, and staphylosanthin. Now, so someone on the picture on the screen now, you have some pictures of what staphylococcus aureus infection causes. So you can have various different types of infections. Since they're found normally in the normal flora or the nasal mucosa, they can cause minor skin infections such as impetigo, fernicles, which is shown in the impetigo shown here as well as folliculitis here in the uh, uh, upper lip of the baby as well as cavern knuckles as well as abscesses which is shown here on the arm they also cause various other more severe diseases which are not skin type lesions such as pneumonia meningitis osteomyelitis and endocarditis and they can also further lead to sepsis and bacteremia bacteremia and sepsis can lead to uti and various types of um, bacteremia basically means when the bacteria gets inside your vital blood vessels such as abdominal aorta and goes and travels into various different organs from there and causes various different types of infection and inflammation they can also mainly what I want you to remember is they cause various skin infections from this slide such as impetigo which you probably know or are aware about fernical cellulitis folliculitis abscesses can cause various big diseases such as bacteremia sepsis and pneumonia and meningitis a few of the examples and scaled syndrome